All right. Looks like we have reached critical mass here. So we are going to get started with our forum. Um, welcome to the candidates and the audience members to the candidate forum for the California Assembly District 23. I'm today's moderator, Abby Longcore, with the League of Women Voters, Los Altos Mountain View. We're the host of today's event. Um, first, a few housekeeping items. Our forum will last one hour. Uh, due to the nature of the webinar, we can't provide technical assistance, but all forums will be recorded and available on our elections page within two days after this event. You can go to our elections page at lwvlamv.org and on our YouTube channel. Um, the link will be added to the Q&A. I will remain visible on your screen along with our candidates and the timer app. Uh, audience members are not shown. Submit any questions about the event through the Q&A. When answered, the answer will be visible to everyone attending. Chat will not be turned on. Questions for our candidates have been submitted with registrations. We've combined similar questions to be able to cover as wide a range of topics as possible. We don't expect that there will be time to take additional questions for the candidates from the audience. The League of Women Voters is a nonprofit organization of all genders. We promote informed, active participation in government. We do not support, oppose, or evaluate political candidates or parties, but after careful study, we do take positions on political issues. The League invites anyone who is interested in supporting democracy and local government to join us. All right, format for today's forum. Each candidate present will make a two-minute opening statement. The questions were selected to be relevant to both candidates and to provide useful information to the audience about issues in this race. Depending on the question, responses will be one minute or two minutes. Finally, the candidates will each have one minute to make a closing statement. An electronic timer will display each candidate's remaining time and will display the order of the candidates responding to each question. We're also giving candidates three opportunities to each make a 30 second rebuttal to something the other candidate says about their position or issue. They may use any or none of these. We ask our candidates to abide by the following. One, time limits. When the timer line turns red, I will say thank you. Please finish by completing your current sentence. Two, respect. Candidates will not interrupt each other. Three, fairness. Campaign marketing materials will not be visible on the candidate's screen. I will now introduce our candidates alphabetically. We have Mark Berman and Lydia Koo. Thank you so much for participating in today's forum. The order of response to the opening statements, questions, and closing statements has been predetermined. Um, and we have made it so that people are answering the same number of one and two minute questions first. So not always alternating, but same number of questions to each candidate first. And we are ready to begin. So we will start with opening statements. Please include the strengths, qualities, and experience that make you the best choice for voters. And Lydia, we're going to start with you first. Thank you, Abby. Um, and I want to say also thank you for hosting us at this important event. Uh, I am Lydia Ku. I'm serving my eighth year as council member and was former mayor of the city of Palo Alto. I ran for council because I wanted to re represent the people. I still do. However, it's been very frustra frustrating and frankly a point of anxiety for me that Sacramento legislators have gradually made that harder. Essentially, the state government has passed a lot of legislation which does not allow me to represent my constituents' best interests. That is not how Sacramento should work, but time and time again, our elected state officials have let us down. They too often forget their communities and what real impact means and get lost among big donors, special interests and internal party politics and endorsements. Listen, Sacramento politics are hurting our state democracy, economy and cost of living instead of helping. California has the highest street homelessness in the nation, the sixth highest crime rate, our fourth graders read 33rd in the nation. Think about that a state that supposedly leads the global knowledge, knowledge economy, and yet our kids struggle to read. How can we call that progress? Meanwhile, costs of living have only risen. Our inefficient transit systems demand bailouts. Um, PG&E rates balloon and state budgets don't balance and indeed will be in deficit for years and years to come. We need to bring common sense back to Sacramento, more focus on what matters and actual results and a lot less on national issues that aren't, the ballot, that aren't on the ballot in California and fighting ideological battles with communities and voters and claiming success simply by how many bills they worked on. I'm the Democrat with a calculator. And so I will say that we deserve better you deserve better. Thank you. 
Nope, Mark Abby, you're, you got Sorry. it. Mark Berman, your opening statement. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Abby. Thank you to the whole League of Women Voters team. I know there are a lot of folks behind the scenes making today's forum possible. And I just want to say I'm very grateful to the League of Women Voters for all the work that you do in helping educate Californians about things that are going to be on their ballot in a in a uh, fact focused uh, and, and uh, you know, very neutral sort of way. I've been proud to team up with the League of Women Voters on a lot of bills, uh, including two bills this year, one where the League of Women Voters was the sponsor and another that the League of Women Voters supported. Um, and that the reason for that is uh, I've focused a lot of my efforts in the legislature on our elections and on defending our democracy and expanding access to our democracy. And that includes bills uh, to make California a permanent vote by mail state. Uh, so everybody should have gotten their ballot in the mail. It also includes a bill that I had to create the where's my ballot tracking system so you can track your ballot through the mail. Uh, and I hope that all people watching today have signed up for the where's my ballot uh, system so that you can track your ballot and make sure that your voice is heard. This year, I had uh, a first in the nation bill to put more responsibility on the social media platforms themselves to reduce misinformation and disinformation in our discourse, in our elections discourse, and was proud to have legal women voters support for that bill as well. Uh, higher education has been a huge priority of mine, increasing the ability for students to get through community college and transfer to four-year schools to support student parents in our higher education systems. And, and uh, consumer protections have been a big focus of mine. I authored the bill to make it easier for you to cancel your subscription. If you signed up online, you should be able to cancel online, uh, as well as to increase transparency around hotel bookings uh, and to crack down on the junk fees, uh, as President Biden put it, that too many hotels are putting on, on Americans and Californians. Uh, I've uh, passed 99 bills out of the legislature, 93 have been signed into law, and most of those with bipartisan support because I uh, introduce common sense policies and solutions to California's problems. Look forward to today's forum. Great, thank you. All right, we are gonna jump into our questions. Uh, this one is gonna go to Mark first. It's a one minute question. So what in your personal story led you to run for or continue your work in the California Assembly? Yeah, uh, it started in Palo Alto. I grew up in Palo Alto uh, in the 80s and 90s. And that was a time uh, where we had significant inequities and inequalities in, in Silicon Valley, like we do today. Uh, but it was a little different. Back then, East Palo Alto uh, had significant amounts of crime. Uh, when I was in middle school, it was the murder capital of the country for a year, more murders per capita than, than any other city in the country. And I saw uh, the inequities and inequalities that we have in our community. I played soccer very competitively and had the teammates from other cities around Palo Alto. And I believe that it's government's role to provide a quality of opportunity. Government can't provide a quality of results, but we can make sure that every child grows up in a safe community. Every child goes to a school that gives them the, the education they need to be successful. Every child has access to high quality health care to, to uh, nutritious food. And those are, and I think government has an important role to play in, ensu in ensuring that equality of opportunity. So that's what got me involved in government in the first place. Thank you. All right, Lydia, same question. Um, I've, um, I've been always very committed to my community as an immigrant coming here, getting the opportunity to uh, represent people. And most of the time it was people who have found me. Um, and asked me to run for uh, for elected office. Um, my history and my continued desire had always been to ensure residents are heard, in this case, in the state level, that people are heard, uh, because we're not supposed to be working for special interest or donors or party or our, our, our colleagues. Instead, we should be really working for the people of California, for Californians, and taking their voices forward um, and making uh, opportunities for them too. Um, I think that, you know, we also have a lot of residents uh, and people who live in our community that actually has a lot of expertise. Uh, we should be going to them to find out boots on the ground, how they feel about things, how they're experiencing matters. Um, I believe the inherent right to expect to have um, that people can have quiet enjoyment in their homes and communities. Okay, thank you. Um, and thank you. All right. So, um, next question will be going to Mark first is a two minute question. Extreme climate events and conditions are increasing. What can the assembly do to increase readiness throughout California? 
Yeah, uh, this is, you know, extreme climate events are impacting the 23rd Assembly District in different ways in different communities. So we have uh, severe uh, impacts of sea level rise on the bay and on the coast. Uh, the 23rd Assembly District in includes 40 miles of California coast in San Mateo County, but also increased wildfires. Uh, and we saw that uh, in the south west portion of the district a couple of years ago uh, at the San Mateo County, Santa Cruz County border. The first bill that I ever introduced in the legislature uh, was to continue uh, the work of my predecessor, Rich Gordon, uh, with a preparing for sea level rise database that is set up to allow different communities across California uh, to, to exchange best practices and learn from what each other are doing and how we can better support each other uh, to, to protect our communities from the impacts, in this case, of sea level rise. Uh, I also introduced a bill to, to create more creative funding mechanisms for communities uh, to be able to fund uh, resiliency in the face of and defense in the in the face of, of climate impacts. This was a bill to allow communities to use enhanced infrastructure financing districts to be able to fund uh, the projects that they need in their communities to be able to defend themselves from climate change. Uh, but the state continues to put a lot more money uh, into uh, helping communities, uh, whether that's uh, better force management practices across California, whether that's providing resources. I brought back $4 million for the town of Pescadero in my first year in the assembly uh, for a flood protection project that they had. It's a community that would flood when it barely rained. Uh, and so the state, I think we have a responsibility to help other communities know what works and what doesn't. And then we should, should fund it. And that's why I was also proud to support, I think it's Prop two, but I can't remember all the prop numbers uh, for a climate change pa uh, bond package that's going to be on the ballot to help communities fund uh, these projects that they need to defend themselves from increased climate change. Thank you. All right, Lydia, same question. Can you repeat it, please? Yes. Extreme climate events and conditions are increasing. What can the assembly do to increase readiness throughout California? And it's two minutes. Thank you. No as, a, as a CERT member, um, I have always been uh, top and front on emergency preparedness and mitigations and in within my community alone. And by the way, uh, my call sign is uh, KI6LGG, so just so everybody knows. But I have been also boots on the ground, learning, teaching emergency preparedness. At the assembly level, I think that we need to get back to basics, you know, making sure the coastside cities have power and also making sure that they have communications, that they're able to use their cell phones. Uh, but more than that, really not support bills that are going to have impacts on uh, coastside cities where they're pushing to develop more when the infrastructure is not in place, which is why there is uh, there is sewage that comes out uh, onto the streets uh, when it rains and even perhaps when it doesn't rain, like um, Mark said uh, in uh, Pescadero. But we do need to kind of look at the foundational infrastructure before we uh, talk about impacting even it more with monies that is not going to the right place. Proposition two actually is going to be using general fund monies in order to um, to fund the uh, 10, 10 billion for uh, climate change and address climate change issues. But the debt on it is even higher. So we need to kind of be a little bit more cognizant of how we're spending money and track when we do give grants, when the assembly or the state government gives grants that they track on the progress. And actually, if it's resolving and actually um, successful in what they're intended to do. And I don't believe, and I know they're not usually tracked and uh, we really can't measure success at this point. Um, but I would, um, as the Democrat with the uh, calculator, I would be tracking and monitoring the success levels and to ensure that what we said we're gonna do, we are doing. Thank you. Okay, this question is going to go to Lydia first. Um, the question is, you have different opinions of how to vote on Proposition 36. Please tell us why you support or oppose this proposition. One minute. Uh, <clears throat> Proposition 47 was actually pretty harmful to a lot of communities as well as persons, especially to the small uh, mom and pop uh, retailers and even the big box ones. But it is frankly, um, it is frankly, 
it not a good lesson to be teaching our children or to be teaching society that it is okay for them to be harmful to others, uh, stealing their things, um, stealing merchandise, and um, that our state government and judicial system seem to think that it's okay just to slap them on the hand and turn them away. It really limits and also causes uh, mental hardship on all of the, our safety officers who has a job to do and is, their hands are tied and they can't do it. And meanwhile, you know, for the person that is experiencing this uh, crime on them, um, it is a, it's traumatic. And then um, with the laws, it is after the fact. The Thank laws you. that are helping people comes in after the fact, not before. Thank you, Thank I'm sorry. You. That's okay. All right, Mark Berman, same question on Prop 36. And sorry, Abby, is this 60 seconds or two minutes? 60 seconds. Gotcha. Okay. That's challenging. Um, so I, I don't support uh, Prop 36. And, and when it comes to tough uh, kind of decisions to make in the criminal justice space, I often reach out to people who I trust in the community. And in this instance, I reached out to Santa Clara County District Attorney Jeff Rosen. Uh, and we had a long, I'm proud to have District Attorney Rosen support as well as Sheriff Bob Johnson support in this race. Uh, and I spoke with with uh, DA Rosen and, and he and I both agree uh, that Prop 36 doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve the problem of retail theft, but what it will do is it's a totally unfunded mandate uh, that will take money away from programs that are currently working, uh, and it will put force the state to put that money towards prisons. And I think we already spent too much money on prisons and not enough money on other programs that benefit our society. That's why I was a leader in the legislature in authoring a bill this year, teaming up with the California Retailers Association to create the retail theft restraining order. Uh, that was a part of our smart on crime retail theft package that the legislature passed and the governor signed. And I was proud to be a leader in protecting our community in that way. Thank you. All right, this question is a two minute question. It's for Lydia first. And the question is, homelessness continues to increase in California in spite of state, county and local programs and funding to address it. How can the assembly help these levels of government work more cooperatively, efficiently and effectively to get more people stably housed? Uh, first, I would say stop sprinkling tax dollars on too many low priorities. Uh, and that's why we have that state budget deficit at this point. Um, let's address homelessness for what it, homelessness itself. And I would say that, you know, one of the things that uh, we really should be looking at, you know, housing, be it market rate or affordable, it's costing over a million one, one million one hundred thousand to build a door. So I really believe that we need to focus only on homelessness and shift money to lower cost shelters and transitional housing, as well as require people to accept that house uh, uh, and living on the outside in our streets and parks and by the creeks is not the place to be. And um, really uh, looking at building housing and uh, thinking that we're gonna be able to afford it and to off it, shift the um, responsibility and the burden of financing it to the people such as what they try to do on RM4 um, is just wrong. It's um, not, it's not, it's it's not being responsible for what the creation is and to say that you know the cities is at fault i will say not you can also to find the money let's do away with rena and all of these housing laws that is costing cities millions and millions of dollars and um put it towards uh improving um and addressing homelessness uh, so that's that's what i would say thank you thank you mark same question well, first off, I think we need more accountability. We need more accountability in how our, our homelessness funding is spent. Uh, and I was proud to support a legislative effort this year uh, to create more accountability in, in how the state has put more money into homelessness um, and, and frankly, the development of affordable housing uh, than at any time in our country, in our in our state's history. Uh, but we need to track that spending better. Uh, and that's why I supported legislation to do that. I was surprised and, and frankly disappointed uh, that that legislation got vetoed. Um, but this is a, an effort. Uh, this is uh, an accountability effort that the legislature is going to continue uh, working on to make sure that the spending that we do, uh, you know, give to our local communities really goes to what it's supposed to. Uh, and it goes to getting people off of the streets. Uh, I also think that we need to build more housing. Um, and, and I think it's uh, I'm, I'm not sure I understand 
how not building housing will help homelessness. Uh, obviously, we need to build more housing to create more units to get people off of the street and into stable housing. We also need to build more shelters. Um, and the reality is that every community needs to step up and be a part of that solution, uh, both in building shelters and in building more housing. Uh, I've been proud to support those efforts in the legislature because that's what we hear from. That's what I hear from my constituents. Uh, a poll was recently done that showed that 67 percent of people who are thinking of leaving California are doing so because of the cost of housing. Uh, this is the one single driver that's impacting people's quality of life. Uh, because they have to spend so much money on their housing and they can't afford to spend things on on food on the table or prescription drugs uh, or cl clothes for their children. Uh, so the more that we can do, the more that we can all really rally together to build more housing in every community across California. I think the better off the 39 million people in the state and the 475,000 people in the 23rd Assembly District are going to be. Uh, and that will help us get people off of the street uh, and into stable housing, which we know that... Uh, is better for them and is better for the community. Thank you. All right, this is a one minute question. Oh, it looks like we have Lydia Ku with her hand raised. Lydia, would you like to use one of your 30 second rebuttals? Yes, if I may. Okay, we got uh, our timer ready to go. Okay. Well, you know, I can I can just say that, you know, with with our deficit in the state right now, it is hard to it's going to be expensive to build because it takes money. And and the reason that it is, is um, right now we're looking at Sacramento obsessed with controlling zoning, which also helps with uh, increasing pricing every time we upzone any piece of property. And a lot of people move here in order to take high paying tech and other jobs, but they have left. And that is because of high cost of living. It could be high cost of housing, but it's also high cost. Thank of you. Period. Thank you. Okay. And Abby, can I ask a quick clarification? Is sure. the rebuttal, um, if you just want to reply, or is it because somebody said something about you that you want to respond to? That is a great question. Um, I will look back at our moderator directions. And our moderator directions say that uh, you can have a 30 second rebuttal to something a candidate says about the other's position. Um, so they should be focused on the on the positions. Great, um, thanks. Great point of clarification, thanks for that. Okay, with that, we're gonna move on to our next question. This is a one minute question and we are going to go to Mark first. And the question is, propose a focus for a new bill. Tell us what you can do before it is introduced to gain support within the assembly for it. Uh, we, we haven't gotten to the point of, of planning for next year's bills yet. I have to get elected first, um, but I will be bringing back a bill that I've uh, introduced a couple of times before to create uh, universal access to computer science education. Uh, this is an equity issue. Uh, we have 40% of schools in Cal, no, excuse me, almost 60% of schools, high schools in California, in California that don't offer computer science to their students, even as an elective. Uh, there are 32 other states across the country that already provide that. And what I've been doing, and I need to to do more of is build a broad coalition of support, uh, working with advocacy organizations, working with employers who desperately need people to graduate from our schools with these skills, uh, and really to work with our communities, especially our underserved uh, and underprivileged communities, to uh, explain to my colleagues, because this bill has died in the Senate Appropriations Committee two years in a row now, to explain to my colleagues how this is an equity issue to make sure that California's high school students get the skills they need for the 21st century economy. Uh, and it's it's going to really take a big village effort to get that successful. Thank you. All right, Lydia, one minute, same question. Uh, I, um, I'm actually working with a group of um, uh, Californians uh, looking at fixing Proposition 19 uh, from a few years ago, where we are, uh, where we can uh, um, reform it and actually bring back inheritances uh, so that um, we can continue creating generational wealth for families versus uh, the children or the person, the benefactor having to um, um, sell off their generational uh, inheritance just because of this law. Um, I have um, another one is I've been working with some other um, legislators who feels that it's been very hard with um, housing and community development where they are overseeing our um, housing elements and RENA. And so uh, audit um, is uh, in the plans and also um, 
to reform uh, HCD as well and how RENA is, um, how its methodology is produced. Thank you. Okay, um, this next question is about the initiative process. It's gonna be a two minute question and we're gonna to go to Mark first. So let's talk about the initiative process. What can be done to discourage measures created by corporations or organizations without obvious public demand for the issue they address? And to make sure that ballot text is clear and accurate. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. It's a great question. Our initiative process has been totally uh, turned on its head uh, from its origin, which was in the early 1900s uh, by Hiram Johnson, uh, who created the initiative process to go around the railroads uh, who, who were buying off politicians in Sacramento um, and, and just, you know, doing what what big business wanted. Now you see big business uh, funding a lot of initiatives and going around the legislature. And I'll tell you from personal experience, it is terribly frustrating. Uh, we feel like certain interests in particular uh, have used the initiative process to hold the legislature hostage and force the legislature to pass uh, legislation that that we don't necessarily think is in the best interest of Californians. But if we don't, the initiative that that polls well will pass and will be even more detrimental for all of Californians. And, and so I think that we should, you know, I, the challenge with reforming the initiative process is, is that you're essentially telling Californians that you're going to take power out of their hands um, because it is technically direct democracy. Uh, I think things that we should explore are increasing uh, the, the signature thresholds needed uh, to, to get initiatives passed. I have been a strong supporter of efforts to have transparency uh, in, in terms of the funding that's going into the initiatives, especially on the ballot, uh, on the signature pages uh, that people are sitting outside your Safeway or your, or your Whole Foods or Trader Joe's collecting signatures on. Uh, and, and so I think increasing transparency, making it uh, easier for Californians to understand the big money that's behind some of these initiatives. I think it's worth considering that, you know, if you're not going to collect signatures using volunteers, maybe you have that threshold be a little higher. Uh, I'm open to all sorts of different creative ideas, uh, but I definitely think the initiative system has been turned on its head from why it was originally created. And Abby, I forgot the second part of your question. Um, oh, the second part of the question was about making sure the text on the ballot is clear and accurate. I actually had a bill to to create a ballot uh, advisory committee under the Secretary of State's office a couple of years ago to make the ballot uh, easier for folks to understand. So that's a different topic. Happy to talk more about that, but fully support it. Thank you. All right, Lydia, two minutes, same question. Um, you know, in actuality, I think that, you know, yeah, corporations and um, and businesses do do these uh, initiatives. But I also believe, and I also see that the legislature do the same thing. They pass a lot of bills. Um, really, uh, a lot of Californians are so busy with their lives, they're not following all the bills that they're passing. And then they find out that the bills has been passed in the legislature and it impacts a lot of the communities and people's lives. Uh, so on both sides, you know, there's issues. I think mostly is, um, you know, when we talk about transparency, I, I think it needs to be further defined what it means transparency when uh, a governor calls for a immediate review of some bill and every uh, all of a sudden they're going into midnight, two o'clock. And like I said, regular Californians are not going to be looking at that. And so um, there, there, there needs to be a better way. And then also having a bill that changes it for initiatives to be every two years, it really restrains Californians from doing what they need to do when elected legislators legislators pass bad bills impactful negatively impactful bills um, lastly I would say that you know um, with the title and summary for most of the initiative having to go to the attorney uh, to the attorney general um, there's no oversight on that where we can the, the process is really tough on Californians individuals who can who can challenge the title and summary what he says goes and sometimes they're not truthful i'll give you a perfect example proposition 47 it says that it's a safer neighborhood and schools act it is not safe and it's not safe for neighborhoods it's not safe for schools instead it has been very impactful and made people feel helpless and actually harmed in so many ways thank you okay um, moving on to our next question. This is a one minute question. It's going to go to Lydia first. Um, what is the state spending too much on? What areas are underfunded and how can we make the money go farther? 
um, the spending way too much on um, on homelessness on high speed rail. I believe that um, not on homelessness. I mean on the housing uh, aspect in trying to destroy cities and um, uh, not allowing them to know not allowing them their own land use and zoning regulations, making it one size fits all, which is just going to be hard on everybody because none of the cities are uh, are the same. They're all unique in their own ways, and they have to find ways on addressing it. Um, they're, and they're spending the high speed rail actually is so much money that is going into it, but it's not it's not progressing. It's uh, it's not progressing as it should have. So we should be refocusing and taking another look at high speed rail, to um, to um, redirect how how it should move forward. It's it's um, not a successful project, and there's just too much money there. Thank you, Mark. Same question. Yeah, it's a great question. A budget is a reflection of our values. Uh, and, and so I think it's very important uh, to, to look for way, areas where we're spending too much that don't reflect our values. And I think we spent too much on prisons. Uh, and I've been proud to, to help lead efforts in the legislature to close down prisons in California. That's how you really uh, get the cost savings uh, from the fact that our prison population has gone down significantly in the past uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, but we need to, I think we need to be spending less money on prisons, less money on locking people people up for, for small offenses for long periods of time, and more money on rehabilitation, more money on drug treatment programs, more money on shelters, more money on affordable housing, because those are the things that will keep people out of prison in the first place, more money on K through 12 education. Uh, you know, let's put money on the areas where we get the biggest return on investment, uh, and not put uh, as much money as we are on uh, locking people up. When I first got elected, we spent more money on prisons than we did UC and CS you spending. I'm proud that that's no longer the case, but we still have some work to do. Great. Thank you. All right. Our next question is a two minute question. Uh, it's going to go to Lydia first. It's a little bit long. So more and more cities, school districts, community college districts are receiving letters claiming that their at-large districts violate the California Voting Rights Act. They commit to switching to district elections to avoid costly lawsuits, not necessarily because doing so will improve diversity on their governing boards. Cities large and small are subject to the same rules regardless of if the city can be logically divided into communities of interest. Is there anything that can be done legislatively to address the one size doesn't fit all cities problem and still encourage diverse governing bodies? Um, are we talking about the lawsuits um, that are taking place or? Yeah, so basically boards get sued, they have to go to districts, they go to districts, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a more representative board. So what could be done um, about that? Uh, well, I think that mostly we can uh, take a time to go and reassess if that is actually doing um, what it was sued for, what the threat of lawsuit was all about, and if there is diversity and equity. As I see it right now, you know, um, when, um, when, when uh, they have gone into district, as a matter of fact, it for some communities, it's actually become worse because it's actually uh, not fully represented by others. Um, and it's um, actually not working out for quite a few of them. So I, I think that, you know, the legislature should be looking at um, finding a way in order to um, uh, review and audit some of these um, uh, school districts to make sure that they are adhering to what they originally decided to do so and also that they should be complying with the California um, Voter uh, Voting Rights Act. Okay, thank you. Mark, same question. Yeah, so, so this does tie back to the California Voting Rights Act. It was the California Voting Rights Act that created uh, this situ situation and the ability for attorneys to uh, provide these, uh, you know, threat of lawsuit letters to, to districts, to government bodies across the the, the state. Uh, I chaired the elections committee for five and a half years. Uh, and early on, I was hearing complaints from some colleagues about their smaller cities that were getting these lawsuit letters, uh, especially from a certain lawyer in Malibu. Uh, and these lawyers get 30 to $35,000 a pop 
uh, for every uh, letter demand letter that they send to cities. Sometimes they don't even update the name of the city. Uh, it'll actually have a different city in the in the in the letter, um, but it doesn't matter. And so, uh, with a couple of colleagues, I convened some of the original sponsors of the California Voting Rights Act. That was um, the ACLU, MALDEF, the Mexican American Legal Defense Fund, I believe maybe the NAACP uh, and, and another organization to try to talk with them about, hey, can we update that we all love uh, the, 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 the purpose of the California Voting Rights Act and what it's trying to accomplish, more diversity uh, in elected officials. But we think that maybe it's being abused uh, and are there things that we can do? I'll tell you, the reception was chilly. Uh, the groups that originally sponsored uh, the CVRA, the California Voters' Rights Act, were not interested uh, in trying to find ways to reform it. But I do think that we need there needs to be uh, more uh, burden on the person bringing the lawsuit or threatening the lawsuit to prove that the solution that they are proposing will actually accomplish the goal that they are stating needs to get accomplished. Uh, and I, we've seen it in some communities and some cities and school districts where it does help uh, and it creates diversity where historically no diversity existed. But in other cities, it creates hardship and it makes it hard uh, for to, to find people who really want to run uh, in really small districts. 2,500, 3,000 people per district, it can be hard to find qualified candidates who want to serve. So I think there is room to improve the CVRA. Nobody wants to roll it back. We want to improve it, but it's hard conversations that need to happen. I'd love LWV, I'd love the League of Women Voters to, to participate in that, those conversations. Thank you. All right. The next question is a one minute question. It's going to go to Mark first. So the health of a democracy depends on community engagement. Are you satisfied with the level of engagement and knowledge of state government among your constituents, including those just old enough to vote? How can you encourage more participation? Uh, am I satisfied? I, you're never satisfied. Uh, I, I think a lot of folks understand the federal government. I think a lot of folks understand uh, local government. Not that many folks understand county and state government. Uh, and, and so... You know, I think we should always be looking for ways to improve civics education in our schools. Uh, I have led efforts in the legislature to improve media literacy in our schools. Data shows that uh, youth get like seventy five percent of youth get their get their news from from social media. Uh, and that's a terrifying reality, especially when there's so much misinformation and disinformation out there, which is why I've led efforts to to uh, integrate media literacy education and AI literacy into our schools, uh, into K through 12 education. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we need to continue. I think the state can do better at funding programs uh, that that improve civics education and uh, improve, you know, knowledge, uh, awareness for folks around voting and the importance of voting throughout California. Uh, so I think we've got room for improvement. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Lydia, same question. Will you repeat it, please? Sure. The health of a democracy depends on community engagement. Are you satisfied with the level of engagement and knowledge of state government among your constituents, including those just old enough to vote? How can you encourage more participation? Um, I know I'm not satisfied with um, the representation or reaching any of the uh, people here in California. Um, a lot of things happen at the state legislat uh, legislature that is very insulated and not enough goes out. I, I also have concerns about um, civic what what is happening live now uh, in um, in young in elementary or middle or even the high school because they're so easy it's very easy um, to for teachers to be only talking about a particular um, a particular opinion and youth laps it up I I think that there's no pros and cons and it doesn't give the youth a chance for them to understand it and to make up their own minds, especially because they have not lived through the experience and the different stages in life. Um, I believe history is very important. And I believe that our youth should know about what's going on in our communities, but not to formulate propaganda on them at an early age. Thank you. Thank you. All right, this is gonna be a one minute question. We're gonna to go to Lydia first. So name something that your office will be able to do for constituents that might come as a surprise. Um, well, I, I, I will be very present in our communities in the cities that is within District 23, um, not just through um, 
uh, health fairs or um, you know all these uh, all the other educational um, forums, but also be um, spending time at farmers market. And I would love to institute what our county supervisor has done, Joe Simidian, where he has sidewalk hours and really be present within the community because I think our community and our residents and also our small businesses uh, need to have a ear and for somebody to take their voice back to uh, Sacramento. So that's one of the things that I plan to um, put have available and you know my uh, people working at my office are not going to be gatekeepers they're actually going to be working in order to make sure that i'm accessible to people and that i will be present thank you thank you mark same question i think a lot of folks don't realize that that if you come to me with your ideas i can turn it into state law uh, I've been proud to introduce a lot of pieces of legislation based on ideas that came to me from my constituents because I am so accessible to them. Uh, and so it is at the community coffees that I hold. It is at the health forums that I hold. It is at the senior scam stopper seminars that I hold where I get great ideas from constituents. And it is also just from random running into constituents on the street. Uh, and so, and it, you don't have to be constituents. I actually had some people who I know in San Mateo County, they, they are not constituents, but they went through a difficult experience when one of their loved ones uh, had an involuntary 5150 hold for medical health uh, challenges and a crisis they were going through. And they these 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 Californians felt like they weren't getting the information they needed to be the best advocate for their loved one. We turned that into a bill that is now law. Uh, as of this year, to make sure that loved ones get the patient's uh, uh, bill of rights uh, handbook that is available uh, when one of their loved ones gets held for a 5150 hold. So, you know, we can really, I'll stop there. My time's up. Thank you. All right. So next question, also a one minute question. We're going to go to Lydia first. Um, and the question is, California welcomes immigrants. What are some of the benefits they provide to the state and what are some of the challenges? Oh, I'm an immigrant, so I think that <laughs> I've, uh, you know, I've I've actually had a really great upbringing, uh, having um, born in Hong Kong, Chinese descent. So I hold a lot of the Chinese values, and then moving to Sudan in Africa, where it is just a completely different world, and everybody is just um, and having the opportunity to meet many uh, people from other countries that end up in the Sudan. And then going to an island, uh, Guam, where I grew up, and it is just such a close knit of people uh, where, you know, their family. And so when I come to America, I look at the same thing. I tend to feel like number one, uh, we're all people, we're all the same. And number two is the ability to achieve uh, and also, um, help other people achieve, help them with a school and education. And I think that that's a lot of things that I can share with my community and residents, knowing negotiations and different traditions and cultures. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mark, same question. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the diversity of California is, is our strength. Uh, and uh, I myself, am not an immigrant. I was born in Texas, so it almost counts. Uh, but my dad's from South Africa and my maternal grandparents are from Poland and Germany uh, and people come to the United States and they come to California uh, oftentimes because they're fleeing persecution wherever it is that they lived as was the case with my grandparents um, and, and they're seeking a better way of life uh, and they come and data shows that our, our immigrant communities they they commit less crime um, and they they create jobs uh, they work hard. Frankly, they do jobs that a lot of of, of uh, U.S. citizens don't want to do and aren't willing to do. Uh, and and so they are significantly strengthen our economy. And I, I think having a diverse community creates. Uh, the experiences that I know I want my future kids to have when when they're growing up. Uh, I, I I think creating a homogeneous society uh, it would be terrible. Uh, and having diversity of opinions and backgrounds that's critically important uh, to to making Thank California you. what it is. Thank you. All right. So we are at our final question before we get to closing statements. Um, and that question is, we're going to do one minute. We're going to go to Mark first. Um, and it is ask and answer the question you wish we had asked you. One minute. One minute. All right. Well, I think the question I wish you would ask is, what is my 
favorite bill I've introduced out of the many bills I've introduced. Uh, and it, it's a tough question, but it's actually a bill that I introduced AB 302 back in 2019, uh, which would have uh, required that our 115 community colleges let their homeless students sleep in their cars on campus because data shows that 20% of our community college students, 10% of CSU, 5% of UC students have experienced homelessness in the prior 12 months. Uh, and we need to do more to recognize them, to destigmatize the experience that they're going through because it's not their fault. Uh, it's our fault because we haven't built enough housing in our communities. Uh, the re Unfortunately, I wasn't successful with that bill. That bill was uh, gutted in the uh, Senate Appropriations Committee, uh, but it was successful in creating statewide awareness of the problem. And it led to my ability to get uh, in a, two years later in the budget to get $40 million ongoing, $40 million every year to create a basic needs center and hire a full-time basic needs coordinator at every community college campus in California to help those students succeed. Thank you. All right, Lydia, same question. Um, the question is probably, uh, what would I do differently at assembly uh, at the state legislature? I would say that I would prioritize better, uh, especially around resources and money. Um, we don't get to, you don't get to the top priorities uh, and get it done because there's so much waste, to, uh, too much money is being wasted and time is spent on lower priorities. Um, mostly because the special interests they pull they pull the legislators in in ten thousand directions, right? So I think that we need to stop fiddling around and get to the real problems and actually get them fixed rather than just waste time on it. Thank you. So prioritizing better. Okay. Thank you. All right. With that, we are going to. Um, move to closing statements. We're actually going to give each candidate two minutes for their closing statement because we have time for that. Um, and I see our timekeeper has already changed the time to two minutes. So great job, Max. Um, and for closing statements, we're going to go Mark first and then Lydia. Um, so Mark, two minutes closing statement. Thank you, Abby, and, and thank you again to the team at, at League of Women Voters uh, for putting on today's forum and helping uh, our the voters of the 23rd Assembly District get educated on, on myself and and, uh, and and Council Member Koo. Um, you know, I have really prioritized in my eight years in the in the assembly helping those who need help the most. Uh, and I spoke a little bit about the work that I've done in higher education, uh, increasing funding for basic needs, uh, homelessness, food insecurity, lack of access to mental health services, helping our student parents. We have over 300,000 student parents in our community college, CSU and UC systems in California. And I've authored two bills uh, to help them get priority registration and also to make sure that they can take the cost of childcare into account when getting their financial aid. Uh, I've also focused on defending our democracy, uh, introducing bills to uh, have California be a permanent vote by mail state, create the where's my ballot tracking system, but also to defend the security uh, of our democracy. Uh, I authored legislation to create the first in the nation state office of elections cybersecurity, which is uh, housed at the Secretary of State's office to work with our 58 counties. So they're using best practices around ballot security. And I had a bill this year uh, that Senator Alex Padilla introduced a, a federal version of a couple of days ago. It was signed into law, the Peace Act, to make it clear that if you bring a gun near a polling place and, and carry it publicly, that it, we, uh, we we assume that it is for intimidation purposes uh, and you will be arrested and you will be, be held to account. I've also introduced a lot of legislation to reduce gun violence in our communities, uh, working with, with healthcare experts uh, to help them get the training they need to try to, when, with a lot of the violence that they see the victims of violence uh, in, in hospitals, but also uh, to try to make sure that before people buy a gun, they're educated about how risky it is. Uh, lastly, I had legislation this year to create the retail theft restraining order and also to combat child sexual abuse material that's generated by artificial intelligence. Uh, respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. All right, Lydia, two minute closing statement. Thank you. It's time to refocus for better results from Sacramento. I'll prioritize the basics, 
homelessness, public safety, schools, infrastructure, and aim to be that Democrat with a calculator. Sprinkling tax dollars on too many lower priorities why we run, why we run state budget deficits, yet still can't fund our most important needs properly. And the money we spend, we need to actually track where it goes and what it achieves, which is why I say no to Proposition 5. Listen, taxation is a big deal, and if the state can't convince two-thirds of voters to pass it, then it should not be passed. To reduce the voter threshold is frankly contempt towards the voters. I keep I value keeping our community safe, is it, which is why I support Proposition 36, which closes significant holds in our criminal justice system. And as your assembly member, I'll support related measures where sensible. Listen, encampments are inhuman to those in them and unfair to others. Homelessness, uh, homelessness need access to basic and safe shelter, but they also have a responsibility to use it when provided. Those suffering severe mental illness and uh, should be in uh, treatment centers, not in our streets or parks. Let's refocus and fix homelessness. I will always support uh, you having a voice about development in your neighborhood and will preserve community input on local housing. Uh, this is where you live. That's let's face facts. California housing production is the same today as four assembly terms ago and housing costs and homelessness have only risen. A lot of talk, a lot of bills and no results. I will actually regulate PG&E. The skyrocketing electricity rates are now twice those of city owned utilities like Palo Alto and Santa Clara. There's no good reason for that. I was mayor of a utility city. I know what electricity costs. Current legislators may be loath to regulate the PG&E monopoly, I won't be. I uh, appreciate your vote for Lydia Ku for State Assembly. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that concludes um, our forum and our questions. I would like to thank the candidates for participating and the volunteers who made this forum possible. The LWV believes that a democratic government depends upon the informed and active participation of its citizens. And we hope that the insights you have gained from this forum will help you in planning your vote. To look at a personalized ballot with information about your candidates and ballot initiatives, please visit vote411. Um, that's vote411.org. Just enter your address to see your ballot choices, candidate statements, and information um, as well on the propositions. When this forum closes, our webpage will appear. Visit our webpage to see our election events and links to recordings of the election events that have already happened. As mentioned, this should be up on our website in the next couple of days for anyone who's missed watching it live. For the November 5th election, please vote early and deposit your signed ballot in a ballot drop box or mailbox as soon as possible. Thank you for helping make our democracy work.